you to turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10. And in addition to Romans, if you don't have a handout, you'll want to be trying to find Zephaniah. Trying is the operative word there, but we do have these verses on your outline sheet if you've got a handout on the way in. But you know, each month, the conference board computes what is called an index of leading economic indicators, and that index is calculated based on economic data. It's designed to be a predictor of future direction for our economy, and then that index is used both by government officials and by businesses and by individual investors to make plans for the future. But about 2,640 years ago, the prophet Zephaniah calculated an index of his own, and rather than focusing on the economy, his index looked at the spiritual condition of the people in his country, which was the nation of Judah. And just like the index of leading economic indicators is a composite of a number of economic statistics, so the, the complacency about the spiritual state of others comes from calculating a number of different factors. So we're looking at the 15th of 16 life essentials that we walk you through in our Discipleship One ministry. That's something that you can sign up for on the table right outside the door, even as you leave today. And this life essential, this particular one, has to do with our relationship to those who are lost, the unsaved world. So because this is so important, I want to call on Zephaniah this morning for an experiential exegesis of spiritual complacency. Because in order to explain our true condition, I'd like all of us to use his passage in this minor prophet to evaluate our own spiritual lives and determine whether or not we are in danger of slipping into complacency, or maybe we already have. Zephaniah describes a number of underlying factors, but I think we can group them into three major components. So first off, notice, if you will, that we have a complacency in our relationships with the unsaved world because, number one, if you're not seeking God yourself, you're not going to lead anybody else to Christ. Hello, somebody. They had a failure to seek God. Now watch, Zephaniah 1 verse 6. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor, nor inquired for Him, meaning they didn't pray. Because you seek God through the Word of God, and you seek God through prayer, and it is tragic to see how few Christians today share the gospel, the good news, with anybody else. And the complacency factor is clear, because... The pollster George Barna tells us that only one out of three Christians ever share their faith with others. Only one out of four even think it's their responsibility to witness to others. And 95% of all church members have never led anybody to Christ. So I would say that as Christians, we are content to be keepers of the aquarium instead of being fishers of men. The first reason is because you're not seeking God yourself. You're not, if you're not seeking Him, you're not going to lead anyone to Him. So the Great Commission has become our great omission in most churches and in most Christians' lives. The cross is essential for eternal life after death. It's essential for abundant life before death, and yet we are not spreading the news of how to be saved. So we do have a complacency in our relationships with the unsaved world because on the other hand, this is number two, if you do not have Christ at the center, you're going to put people's spiritual state on the circumference. These people separated their life into secular and sacred. Watch verse 10 of Zephaniah 1, verse 10. It shall come to pass that in that day, saith the Lord, there, sh there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate and a howling from the second, second gate, a great crashing from the hills. How ye inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down. All they that bear silver are cut off. Now, okay, uh, 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 verse, verse 10. It shall come to pass in that day. Now, I know what that day is in a prophetic sense, but do you know what that day is in a personal sense? Because the fish gate was on the north wall of Jerusalem, and it got its name because the fishermen would bring in their catch for the day, and so they would come in through that gate, and therefore, Captain D's and Long John Silver was right there nearby. 
And we know that Jesus talks about evangelism as going out fishing for men. The second gate was the second quarter or the, the neighborhood northeast of the temple where many of the wealthy businessmen lived. It was kind of the country club plaza, the Johnson County of Jerusalem. And Maktesh was downtown Wall Street. It was the banking and business district of the capital. These people would go to church on Saturday, in their case on Saturday, but the rest of the week they engaged in making payday loans, title loans, loan sharking at high interest so they can make bigger profits off of people who could least afford it. And that was only possible because they divided their life into religious and business. So I think not a lot has changed in the last 2,600 years. That is why that day is this day. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul writes that the spiritual offering that God wants from you is to take every aspect of your life and put Jesus at the center of it all. Because if you do not seek God yourself, you will not lead anyone to Christ. If you do not make Christ the center, you will, not, you will put people's spiritual state on the circumference. And we have a complacency in our relationships with the unsaved world. Because third, third, if you do not get the lead out, you're going to settle on your lees. Okay, look at verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. See, this is why I love a King James Bible above all others right here. Wine settles on its lees. Uh, lees describes the sediment that collects at the bottom of a bottle that is, if that bottle is not turned up, poured out, and used, it settles on its lees. So, so if you do not use it, you lose it. But more than that, more than that, because lees is a word that refers to deposits of dead yeast. So it's much more than just sediment, like the modern translations all make it. Lees means that what was alive and fermenting is now dead and unproductive. And in the case of a person who's a Christian by being born again, if you do not share your testimony, your attitude starts to sour. You start complaining and murmuring against everything else. If you do not get upended, poured out, and used for God, then you settle into a sediment of darkness and bitterness. So there is a time limit to how long you can let wine settle on its lees. Good wine left too long becomes too thick to drink. And I don't see why you're not getting this, because Paul said that is the state of modern Christianity today. Even those who know the gospel do not tell others how to believe the gospel. They are too tolerant, too skeptical, too cynical, and, 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 and they don't get the gospel out to anybody else. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. Look, Alan, I don't know who told you that I was going to be here today, but you sure are right about it. I cannot remember the last time I went to church and they talked about soul winning and witnessing and getting the gospel to the lost so that they could be saved. I mean, it seems like today all we're concerned about is hipster Christianity. Hipster, hipster, we sing hipster hymns. We collect money to build hipster facilities. We go out and do hipster things that make us look good in the eyes of the lost. I mean, we really don't witness to the lost. We don't get the good news of the gospel to the lost, but we sure do make them say good things about us. So don't let me leave here till you tell me, how can I get out of the complacency I walked in here with, especially as it concerns the eternal state of people's souls? I'd be glad to help you out. Give me a minute to unpack this passage in Romans. We'll clothe ourselves with its truth, get our healing, and head out of here ready to bring somebody with us next Sunday. Because next Sunday we're going to talk about how we can overcome the overwhelming by looking at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. But let me take you to our text because you'll notice in this very familiar passage in Romans 10 how the articulate apostle Paul speaks eloquently about a message that is worth being shared. And in so doing, he tells us today how to guard against spiritual complacency. Anybody want to hear this? Just give me a thumbs up this morning. Okay, give me a th okay. I'll even take paralysis as consent because maybe you're just complacent today. Okay, so first off, notice if you will, if you want to get the lead out, if you want to lift up off your lees so that you don't become thick and bitter and too dark to enjoy, 
then here's number one. There is a message to be believed. Let me give you the context of our text so that what I say will not become a pretext today. In the prior chapters, Paul is drawing down a contrast between the righteousness that is by the law and the righteousness that is by faith. So he now summarizes the gospel by showing us if a person is to accept the gospel, there must be belief on Jesus based on God's message. And my point is this. Here's our thesis for today's study. If you do not believe the message of the Bible, you're never going to share with somebody else the gospel. Are you leading or are you lagging in Bible believing? And here's why I think the Bible issue is so important. Here is why we are so lukewarm in Christianity today. Because if you do not believe the Bible, you will be lackadaisical about sharing the message of the gospel. And in sharing the message of the gospel, you better recognize, and this is letter A, there's a confession that's required. Look at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Without this confession of belief, you really don't have saving faith. And this confession involves two things, according to Paul. You must make an outward announcement. Watch, verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... Now, you've got to understand, Paul is writing to Romans. In Rome, of all places, you had to worship the emperor. So every year, you might be expected to walk up to a Roman official and make a verbal pledge of allegiance, a confession of the lordship of Savior Caesar. Verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So an outward announcement is imperative as a tangible expression of an inward belief or trust you have in your heart. And you trust Jesus for eternal life. That means you've got to pray and ask Jesus to be your Lord. See, your mouth is the expression of your consciousness. We don't know what your heart belief is in your mind until it gets out of your mouth. So you have to come to the place you recognize Jesus as Lord of your life and you are willing to pray and ask Him in. You are willing to announce that fact publicly because check this, this is our first point for study. After you confess Jesus as Lord in prayer, then you'll be willing to testify how Jesus saved you and be a witness. That is how we relate to the lost world. Until you got saved, you were, you were Lord of your own life. Nobody told you what to do except yourself. You said with William Ernest Hen Henley, Out of the light that covers me, black is the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I've not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I... And the captain of my soul. But you know, after you trusted Christ, you got saved. And now you're able to say with Dorothea Day, Out of the night that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since His the sway of circumstance, I would not wince or cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. I have no fear, though straight the gate He cleared from punishment the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. There comes a time as God's Spirit works in you heart, your heart, you begin to see the reality of life as God made it, and you realize and you announce, Jesus is my Lord. Paul shows us the second aspect of this confession in verse 9. Not only must there be an outward announcement, there must be an inward acknowledgement. Verse 9 says that if thou shalt believe in thine heart... That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So saying you got saved is not sufficient. A lot of people make a profession who never really have possession. And it's only at that moment that your heart lays hold of the kernel truth of the gospel. It is only that that moment that in your heart there is an exchange of life. Your sinful rotten life for the new spotless life of Christ. You believe the kernel truth of the gospel that Jesus' death on the cross was a substitutionary sacrifice for you. He was sacrificed for your sin. He died as a substitute in your place. He took God's hell so God could freely give you His heaven by grace. You've got to swallow that kernel truth in order to be saved. 
You must not only believe that Jesus lived, but that He lives. And that He lives right now in you because you asked Him to. Let me open a window on that word. There are three preachers at Benetti's Coffee Shop discussing the time when life actually begins. And the first preacher said, look, life begins when the child takes his or her first breath. And the second one said no. And then he finished. It begins when that child is conceived. But the last preacher said, you both got it wrong. Life begins when the last child leaves the house and the dog dies. <laughs> and my point is, my point is eternal life begins as soon as you give your soul to the Savior. The moment you give your heart to Christ, Jesus forgives you of your sin. He clothes you with His righteousness. He puts His Holy Spirit inside of you. And you have an everlasting life from that moment on. Has there been a time when you believed in your heart and you claimed through prayer that Jesus was your only way to heaven? I'm not talking about walking down an aisle or even praying the sinner's prayer per se. I'm talking about you making a decision to trust Jesus for eternal life. A belief with your heart that produces a confession with your mouth because the two things go hand in hand. There must first be an inward acknowledgement, then there will automatically be an outward announcement. But if you really want to be saved, then a confession is required. And second, second, this is letter B. There is a confidence that is revealed. Verse 11. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Let the whole church say not. Paul is quoting the scroll of Isaiah, but look, Isaiah spins it this way. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not what? Make haste. Now, I knew I was teaching here today, and y'all are sophisticated, cultivated, educated crowd. So I knew I couldn't be no lazy preacher. I'd have to go home and do my homework. So I performed an etymological investigation of that word ashamed in verse 11 of Romans 10, and also here in Isaiah 28. And you know, I discovered it's not only a powerful word, it's also an important word. Because it is in that word we discover the confidence that Paul is describing. Because while Isaiah literally says, and I don't know what it says in your translation, but the Hebrew and the King James literally says, make haste. What it has to do with is your emotions. Where instead of waiting on God, you let your emotions drive you. Because let me hit you with this definition. A shame means to be dishonored, disgraced, or disappointed because you acted too quick. You didn't trust the Lord. It describes when a person's hope has been frustrated or shattered, when a person really trusts Christ and asks Him to be in their heart as Lord, they don't have to worry about the possibility of being disgraced. They don't have to worry about being disappointed because now they can wait on the Lord instead of making haste. Instead of being driven by their emotions, they can trust in God. Instead of being driven by anxiety or fear or depression, the hope they place in Jesus will not be frustrated or shattered because when we trust Him, a confidence is revealed. Now, I don't know about you, but I got saved in the summer of 1970 when I heard a Billy Graham television crusade, and I was just a young kid then, but Billy Graham said, I could have eternal life if I trusted in Jesus Christ. And since then, I've never been disappointed, not in Jesus. My feet are on the rock, my name is on a roll, that's how I like my rock and roll. Jesus never lets me down. He picks me up. So if you're going to believe this gospel good news, there's a confession required. There's a confidence revealed. There must be belief in the message. But then on the other hand, and this is number two, <coughs> the, the message must be believed, but also the message has a basis. Verse 12, I think, is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Paul is setting a foundation of common ground, of equality among all of us, because the ground is level at the cross. And watch as he tells us about the first leveling basis, which is the law of equality, letter A, the law of equality. Let the whole church say law. law. Now see, if Steve were here, you, you drop R's on things that have R's, you add R's on things that don't. He would say it, the law. Okay, the law of equality. Verse 12, Romans 10. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Now, Paul's writing to Roman Christians, but many Christians in Rome were actually Jews. And the Jews always found it unbelievable that the way to God was no longer through the law. 
Second, they had a hard time believing that the way to God was open to Lottie, Dottie, and every little body. See, the Jews thought Gentiles weren't as good as them. See, every individual Jew thought he was already a child of God because God had chosen the Jews as a people. Paul says, look, if you had taken dispensational theology in the Bible Institute, you'd understand the rules have changed. It is a new dispensation now. God no longer dispenses eternal life through the law, but through the Lord. Now let me open a window on that word because with how high the last Powerball got and since none of you all won it, I started studying up on the lottery and the first state lottery was a $100,000 sweepstakes and it was tied to the winner of a horse race held in New Hampshire in 1964. But today, 43 states plus D.C. and Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands all have lotteries and they generate about $18 billion in profits for state revenue. Okay, now my point is, my point is this, if you win, tithe. Okay, but second, second, <laughs> second, second, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter where you've been, your odds are better with God yeah. than with the lottery. Why? Because back in Romans 2, verse 11, Paul tells us, there's no respect of persons with God. God looks at your heart, so in His sight, there's no difference between you and the richest man on Forbes' list. The way is equal, the way is open, because when we look at Calvary and we consider the gospel, we see a place where the ground is level and everyone is equal. There is a law of equality. But the second basis is letter B, the Lord of equality. Let the whole church say Lord. Lord. Verse 12, for the same Lord is uh, over all, is rich unto all that call upon Him. So there's not only a law, there's a Lord to enforce the law. The law would not be in effect if there was not a Lord to enforce it. We learned that in the hundred years after Reconstruction. Right up until the civil rights movement. If somebody wasn't going to enforce it, then it didn't matter. But the Lord operates by a law. So there's no sin too dark. There's no situation too dismal. There is no secret too deep that He cannot forgive you. There is no problem He cannot solve. There is no predicament He cannot see. There is no person He cannot save. There's no addiction He can't get you out of. He is the Lord who is over all and He is rich to all. But this verse says you have to call. A.B. Simpson said, the gospel tells rebellious men God is reconciled, justice is satisfied, sin has been atoned for, the judgment of the guilty is revoked, the condemnation of the sinner is canceled, the curse of the law is blotted out, the gates of hell are closed, the portals of heaven open, the power of sin subdued, the guilty conscience healed, the broken heart comforted, and the sorrow of the fall all undone. Hallelujah for the gospel. Yeah. God is unmoved by status. He is unmarveled by service. He is unmatched in salvation. That is why Johnson Oatman wrote, Did ever saint find this friend forsake us? No, not one. No, not one. Or sinner find that he would not take him? No, not one. No, not one. You can come to him just as you are, to him just as he is. You can come just as you are, but you won't stay as you is. Come as you are, but you will not stay as you come. Because He is the Lord of equality, enforcing the law of equality is the basis of the gospel. And He is the one who, who, he is the, one who is the embodiment of the equality he's, he's conforming us to. He conforms us to His own image. And then in the final analysis, this is number three. The message brings a blessing. Let the whole church say blessing. Paul concludes his thought not by describing the gospel good news as, as to its necessity for belief or just as basis for belief, but also its blessing. And first off we find, and this is letter A, he speaks of a gracious offer. Look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. When you read that word, whosoever, it eliminates all doubts about the realm of the invitation. This invitation is extended. It is available to you. You know, a lot of denominations today, though they claim to be Christian, they say it's not available to you unless you are within the boundary markers of the elect. 
And that means either God arbitrarily selects you, or that your parents had to baptize you as an infant to get you within those bounds. Now, Paul says, no, this is a whosoever gospel. It's not a Baptist gospel. It's a whosoever gospel. It's not just a Harvest Church gospel. It's a whosoever gospel. And since God declares a message of whosoever, we deliver a message of whosoever to you today. Are you not glad that even this morning, you can view that word whosoever and you can underline it and then view it as a blank and write your name in that blank and get saved today? Because if you do, Christ becomes for you, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, that Christ hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You go from darkness to light, from corruption to cleanness, from deadness to everlasting life. He speaks of a gracious offer, but He also tells us, and this is letter B, about a glorious outcome, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not may be saved, not could be, should be, would be saved, but shall be saved. Now let me open a window on that word as we close because a couple of, there was a couple one time they took their kids to Carlsbad Caverns and they had an 11 year old boy and a 7 year old girl and when they reached the deepest point of that cavern the guide turned off all the lights. They were deep below the surface of the earth so the little girl surrounded by utter darkness she started to cry but almost immediately her brother said don't cry because somebody here knows how to turn on the lights. And I don't see why you're not getting this because that is exactly what happens when you finally choose to accept this gracious offer of the gospel. You experience a glorious outcome because Jesus is the light of the world. Things you didn't understand, you begin to see and comprehend. Things you didn't even know are now, are now revealed to you. You say, Alan, but you know, all this just sounds too easy. And I say, yeah, you're right. That is why so many people miss it. They miss it not because they think they're too bad a sinner. They miss it because they want to stay in their sins. They think they're not too bad a sinner. They just want to stay in their sins. They don't really want to get saved and come out of their sins and let God lead them into living for Him as Lord. But the fact still remains as testified by this verse, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Some of you haven't been able to follow me this whole sermon because you've been thinking about this index of spiritual, leading spiritual complacency indicators that Zephaniah gave us. Can I share with you what Zephaniah says in the next chapter, chapter 2? Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought His judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. That's what Zephaniah's name means. Hidden by the Lord. So before the day of your death, before the day of judgment, before you stand sinful before an absolutely holy God, Zephaniah says you've got to do three things, and I guess we could call this Zephaniah's plan of salvation. Number one, you've got to show up. Verse, verse one, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. You need to come to an active body of believers where you can hear the gospel preached. I don't know, a Christian without a church that they are active in and bringing other people to is like, is like a, a person who is out, a, a spirit outside of a body. You dead. You're acting dead. So it's, it, okay, so come, come to church, but it's not enough to come to church if while at church you don't do number two, seek. Number one, show up. Number two, seek. Verse 3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought His judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. There are three things here you're commanded to seek. Because these are, the, these are the three things you need to be saved. And you do not have these things in yourself. 
I like what Troy said last Sunday. You don't have it in yourself, so you need to come get it. You don't have it in yourself. You need to pray and ask God for it. You need to seek the Lord. You need to seek righteousness. And here's how we'd put it. You need to seek humility. Now watch. You get righteousness and meekness only in the Lord. Watch. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 30 and 31 on your outline sheet. But of God are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that is according as it is written. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That is why salvation involves your personal submission. It is not automatic. It is not through right ritual or religious ceremony. It is only through Christ as you seek Him. And number three, you submit. Show up, seek, submit. Verse 3, All ye which have wrought His judgment, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Those who are hidden from God's wrath over sin are the ones who are gathered because they've sought and they've submitted to His judgment. Here's our second point for study, and then I raise up out of here. You cannot keep the commandments in order to get saved, but you have to obey the command to believe on Jesus in order to be saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian, please pray.